When you're building a home, you're dealing with the specifications of the house. Then you're building with design, design changes, and CCC. With development, add another five layers to it. It's just quite complex. What is success to you? I think it was a learn to love it experience. And there's always pitfalls that you can fall in, but then you've got no one else to blame but yourself. Number one thing if you're struggling is to catch up with people about it. Hey guys, before we kick off this episode, I just want to thank our content partners. You guys know it, Abodo, for supporting the Better Builder podcast. Now, I've actually firsthand heard from a lot of builders who love working with Abodo Timbers. Over the last 20 years, they've perfected the art of thermally modifying New Zealand radiata. Now, that just means there's no chemicals on there. They pretty much just use steam and heat to modify the timber. So what does that mean? It's great on the tools, it's super light, it's durable and stable, which we know helps deliver a great end result for your clients. Good job, Aboto. Now let's get this episode rolling. Oliver Austin, thanks for coming on the podcast. No problem, thanks for having me. Yeah, um, we had a few, we had some scheduling conflicts and mostly on my side, but uh, you finally made it. So uh, no, I appreciate you coming on, man. Excellent, thanks. Well, um, and uh, yeah, I wanted to have a bit of a chat with you because uh, obviously you've been um, very much across the the multi you know in the multi unit game, um, and so yeah, we'll have a bit of a yarn around that. I'm pretty kind of keen to find out what's happening in that market in New Zealand at the moment, and and what you guys are doing to kind of get those projects you know ticking along, because a lot of those projects aren't really going ahead at the moment, right? Um, but first, before we get into that, like, give me a bit of a, a, a bit of a background. We always like to kind of figure out sort of who is, uh, you know, who is Oliver. Like, how did you did you grow up around Auckland, or where, where did you grow up? Yep. So, I've been in Auckland my whole life. Um, went to St Kent's College. Um, cool. After that, did a business degree, then travelled, then building apprenticeship, then into Calmar Construction. So my um, thought process on that was always do the hardest first. Right. If, if you can have a long career, you want to be going to a 92-unit apartment block, which is an absolute nightmare. So that's full-on commercial construction, hundreds and hundreds of trades each day, a three-year build, um, and you just, you, you're just fully involved in it, and it's yeah. just very complicated. So That's what you did at Colmar? That was Kalmar. Right. Yep. Okay. Yeah. So, um, okay, cool. I want to talk about that. Firstly, St. Kent's. Yes. Um, who were you in high school? Oh, the high school was interesting. Um, definitely sort of finding yourself. Um, yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a very much, a you know, you're still at a very young age and you're not sure what you want to do in your life and... Do you follow your father's footsteps or your grandparents or where do you go? So for me, I actually end up doing a you know, a business degree in marketing and management, nothing to do with building. And that was because it was my dad's side. But what did he do? Marketing management. Right. Yep. And where'd you go? Auckland? Uh I went to AUT in Auckland. Oh, okay, yes. cool. Yeah. And you studied marketing and management? Yes. Got like a BCom or yes, yeah, yes. And um, what was that? What was uni like? Did did you did you find yourself finally when you went to uni or not? Yeah, quite? I, I would say so. You, uni is is really good to show yourself you can stick to something. You completing a three to four year um, course, a degree, and you've got to be in it the, the full time, and, and it's and it's really really. Um, a good thing to get that over the line and um, then move on to your next stage um, and, and what you want to do next. Yeah. So do you think uni still a good idea? Like you've got a couple of daughters, right? Yes. Okay, young young yes. kids, young <clears throat> daughters. Um, so you're a dad when they, you know, when they turn 18 or whatever, would you recommend they go to yep. uni? A hundred percent. Education is the most important thing. Um I now look back on how long I took throughout my 20s and I wouldn't recommend starting a business until your 30s. Um, I sort of call it to myself the 10-year apprenticeship. 
and you need to spend that time. You you can't fast track it, and I think we all just as an industry slow down, make your mistakes in your twenties, then start. Um, there's no rush at all. Yeah, and how old are you now? Uh, thirty two. Thirty two. Okay, so you went to uni, did, got your degree, and then what? Did you always know that you wanted to get into construction or anything? Or did you just, did you, what did you do after that? Were you like, okay, I'm going to go traveling? Or yes, just... so we went um, traveling with my, with my current, my only wife. <laughs> <laughs> current wife? Not... Current wife. I've only had one, thank God. Um, then that was, you know, to, just to see the world and um, open your eyes to what's out there. And then... Always in the back of my mind, I wanted to do something practical, um, and you know, construction. That's a you know, it's it's. I, I I'm always been interested in property, renovations, new builds, um, investing in property. So my grandparents did a lot of that on the shore, um, and yeah, major interest in property since I was young. Yeah. Did you ever read like Rich Dad Poor Dad and those sort of books when you were young? Yeah, or? definitely, definitely. Yeah. Um, the, yeah, yeah, a lot of those books um, and just teaching you sort of the, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. all like the property related things, eh? Like I've, I remember I was sitting one time, I mean my wife was having a coffee or something and I was just like, it was like I, was look, I was just saying to her, I was like, everyone that I know that, ha- that are, you know, if you look at people that are like sort of 50, 60, 70, and I was like, everyone I know that's really, really financially set have all made their money from property in New Zealand. Definitely. Like you can be romantic about, you know, starting business, other sort of businesses or whatever, but in the end of the day, somehow through investment property or some development or a bit of both, um, or up, you know, um, you know, buying something and um, refurbing it or whatever, uh, has always come back to property. 100%. And um, so that's just the, yep. that's just the yep. reality. We, we bought our first property at 20, and then renovated that for three years, on to your next one, renovated that, um, and then into our current family home. So property, yeah, it's a huge, um, one of the major vehicles of any financial um, path. Yeah, yeah, 100%, especially in New Zealand, uh, probably a bit of Australia as well. Um, okay, so uh, after that, you then went travelling, and then did you go travelling first, and then you came back? And yes, travelling. To- so we went through Europe, um, drove around fifteen thousand k's. Uh, went to running with the Bulls, Oktoberfest, all that sort of yeah fun stuff. All like the classic, like OE, yeah. classic OE. Did the hucker on Sail Croatia with um, a few of the lads. So that was it's it's good fun. Yeah, yeah. they love Kiwis over there. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then you came back, and obviously, when you go traveling, hey, you sort of it sort of clears your mind, makes you figure out what you really want to do in life, right? Definitely. So, with a cleansed mind, you came back, and you're like, okay, cool, I'm gonna. So it's, it must be quite like you might you must have um, sort of parked the ego a little bit to go. I have a de- I have a business degree. I've just traveled. I'm gonna come back and like start getting onto a. Okay, get up early in the morning and go into a building site that I know nothing about and start learning from scratch? Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, it was definitely a wake-up call, um, you know, in the middle of the winter, um, getting the tool belt on. Um, but, uh, you know, it was an amazing experience. And you, you, ego and construction um, shouldn't exist, really. Like, um, you're only as good as your trades and what you know and what you're happy to put yourself in that sort of position um so yeah i've always just been big on you've got to um you know lead and and show that you can do what what you're asking of other people yeah yeah and so you how long did uh did you so who did you work for was that at Kalma when you were working as that an apprentice was, or so apprentice was goodwin construction okay that's yep. a um sort of mid-size they do some high-end renovations and extensions um then it was over to Kalma, where you would call it sort of like a cadetship, um, where you're just learning and, um, yeah, helping out the uh, site supervisors and project managers. Cool. So that's kind of a good way of doing it. So you didn't like go, yeah, I'm going to get qualified and go start my own business. You went and worked for a big company. I Yeah. I, I think it's um, a really good way to do it because I – 
it's it's very difficult, even if you're a um, a top foreman, a top builder, to get your qualification and say, I'm going to start a business. If you waited another three to five years, the the, the experiences and the knowledge you gain is, is just so worth it. There's just no rush. Um, that's what I really worked out in, in my process. Yeah. 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 Just like slowing it down, eh? Like seems to be the the message I get from a lot of successful guys. Just don't rush, slow down, learn a bit more before you go out on your own. 100%. Um, the risk is just so high. Um, the risk is hugely high. You were, <laughs> construction's millions of dollars. So any project um, is a million plus, and it's it's probably the biggest expenditure that couple will possibly spend in their lifetime. So you just can't make mistakes. It's just not an option, um, in my opinion. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, when you have to like risk $10 to make one every time, there's not a lot of room for that much room for movement yeah. in yeah. terms of making big mistakes. Yep, it's their life. It's, um, it's, it's your life too. So you just got to really plan and really have a thought out process. Yeah, for sure. Okay, so... Um, after that, we had a little bit of a chat off air. So then you, uh, from there, you kind of obviously learned a lot about uh, multi-unit development. Um, and then how many years did you work there before you moved on to uh, Williams Corporation? Um, so Kalmar was two and a half. And then I moved to a company called Miles Construction, then to Williams Corporation. Right. Um, Miles Construction did a lot of um, social housing, multi-unit um, KO, um, but a lot of multi-unit, um, and then on to Williams Corporation, um, yeah, which I spent about three years at. Um, what's it like working at Williams Corporation? What's the what's yeah. the vibe with those guys? Um, that was in the peak of the market, right? So that's when people thought um, there's not going to be a house to buy tomorrow. So that was full on, right? So you got sales agents constantly buying land, um, BC plans coming through, sites starting every second week. Um, at the peak of Williams Corp, I was solely looking after 17 sites. So, <laughs> yeah. So that's like an, doing an apprenticeship in development, right? Yep. You're looking after 17 sites, very structured processes. And very good at what they did, do. Um, and now, now that I've done the amount of work condensed into that amount of time, what I'm doing now is, um, yeah, it's really manageable, and it's um, I can really slow it down and, and be effective for, you know, the, the clients that we look after. So when you work, when you look after 17 sites, what is what does your day to day look like? <clears throat> So you're, oh, you're starting at probably six. Um, you might go into the office to do a few emails and you know RFIs, um, all that sort of stuff, and then you're out on the road. You're going to every single site every day, taking you know multiple photos. You're doing about five roles in one. So you're, you're a site supervisor, site manager, project manager. Um, looking at design issues and then yeah coordinating all the subs so Cheapest. full on yeah they pay a lot um oh a typical salary but that they have other incentives so my uncle bought six houses off them for example right and you got a commission out of the sale right so very fair company and um yeah they did really well in their 20s yeah, yeah. We're looking to get Matthew or uh, Horncastle on the on the podcast. I think he's um, pretty keen to come on um, at some point. Um, what makes them so special? You know, they're so young. Yeah. Um, uh, him and Blair, right? And yep. then, uh, but they've run such an amazing business, probably like a billion dollars or something, right? That they've probably turned yeah. over. Yeah. Um, what makes them? You know, because success leaves clues, right? Like, what have you seen in them that that you've sort of taken into where you're at? Um, it would be the, the one, the work ethic, just outstanding, right? Outstanding, right? So Blair approves every single invoice that comes through. Um, the process, so we implemented and created, you know, as a team as well as a company, 
checklists which have um, 150 items during the development process um, in the various sectors. So you've got finance, construction, design, um, the QA process. So the, in other words, they're just doing everything really, really well. And yeah, it's just really, really full on. Yeah, and so with them, um, is Blair like more like the project guy and then uh matthew is more the front facing guy or is it matthew's the sales um guy and the design guy and then blair is the qs and the project manager in charge of that side but both um you know sharing deals and and just constantly looking for projects and land and and that sort of thing they they do compliment complement each other very well yeah. So um, how do they describe it? Um, Matthew's jumping off the cliff, Blair's the rope, and Catherine, yeah. <laughs> Matthew's mum, is holding Blair back. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> so I'll never forget that. It's just like the perfect analogy. Right, yeah. <laughs> now it can be pretty cool. It'd be pretty cool to get him on to kind of get us, um, just learn a little bit from him as well. So that'd be kind of fun. Yes. And then we just, reali- we just um, saw uh, Duval, which is another big developer, uh, and also they have a fund attached to that and a few other businesses has just gone into, um, you know, I don't know what they call it, temporary liquidation, liquidation yep. or whatever it's called. Um, what would you say, what, what do you think is, was the sort of the downfall of that? Is it just market related or what are your thoughts? Um, yeah, tricky one. Um, not that I don't know a lot about them, um, but I'll just as a as a glance i would say just too big too big too too much of an in a in a hurry you yeah. know like new zealand's a small place it is boom and bust and it always will be um you know the current government is hopefully implementing all sorts of different stuff that we don't have it so intense the cycle where it slows down for 2 to 3 years and it is more stabilized but I think we've all got to remember that, yeah, it's very boom and bust and um, it's just New Zealand. It's just slow and steady and um, don't get big too soon. Yeah. And what are, you, what are your thoughts on the, on the current – let's talk a little bit about the current multi-unit market in New Zealand and Auckland. From my point of view, just talking to people, it sort of looked like it was just – like you said a few years ago, it was just all guns blazing – um, people couldn't sell these units fast enough and it sort of took a bit of a nosedive. Um, now, you know, you have all these backlog of sites that they aren't developing now because the feasibility don't stack up. Uh, what are your sort of point of view on the current market at the moment? Where are things at? Um, there's, there's a lot of different layers to it, right? Like the lower end of the market is the investment market, which is if it gives you a return and it stacks up as an investment, there's nothing wrong with it and they should go ahead. Um, that's that's completely fine. So that's one option. Um, you, you've got to have that return and it's got to actually work on paper. Um, then I think the market that's going really well is the mid to high end. Um, so we have... Uh, two of our sites at the moment is Takapuna and Remura. Both standalone houses. One has three, one has two. Um, so that's taking an existing single house on both and putting two or three. Right. Yeah, so you've got lifts, you've got high-end finishings, um, and it's just an appealing market for um, maybe someone who the kids have just left or they're looking to retire, downsize. It's... It's something that's going to be really appealing with how many, um, the age of our sort of um, population. Yep. Um, so I think that's a really good option, just to, just building really good quality stuff in really good locations um, that work for clients' needs and just having a really good product. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I've got, um, I told you off here, I've got a friend that's looking to do a development at the moment in sort of more of a, um, higher socioeconomic um, suburb and what are sort of the things that he should be looking out for in that in terms of if he's looking to you know in terms of making it stack yeah um, in terms of 
what are the square meter rates at the moment, building in those areas and um, and sort of what should he be focused on in terms of the end product, what clients like to see when they're downsizing? Yeah. Um, square meter rate for something mid to high end, probably if you just said three and a half thousand plus GST, that slab upwards. Right. So that, um, you know, you're turning the key at the end of the day, but it's not development costs. Development yeah. costs are roughly a hundred thousand per unit you put on the site. So that's really important to add in there. But in terms of the product, just catering for that market that you want to sell to. So you wouldn't have ovens at, at below bench height if you know the the elder, elder people wanted to access them, right? Um, looking at the right layouts of kitchens, bathrooms, um, having baths, not showers over baths, um, having you know, all level entry or lifts, etc. So just being really aware of who you're trying to sell to, because at the end of the day, they just won't buy them um, if, if they're not happy with what they're seeing. Yeah. Yeah, because yeah, it's going to be, because those are what sort of, uh, those units would go for like over two mil, right? Sort of Definitely, definitely. They're, um, so Takapuna is, you know, well over two mil. Um, that's in Lake Papuki Drive, um, really central, all day sun, um, just really, really nice. Um, but yeah, yeah. So you just got to be, yeah, yeah. Just got to be sort of careful, uh, not careful. Just be aware of what you're. Just really know your end buyer. Exactly. And I guess the way to do that is probably talk to real estate agents, see what people are looking for, what's selling well, what's not. Right. Definitely, definitely. And you got to remember, development's not just build something and sell it. It is, uh, you know, a buyer's. That's the that's the, that's that's the result at the end of the day. The, the buyer is purchasing the property. They have to want what they're buying. So um, I think gone are the days of just um, you know the cheapest tiles, the cheapest sort of kitchen setup. Just putting more thought into it um, is is going to be massively important to to do well. I think. Yeah, and those. Uh, uh, so obviously you're saying the lower end sort of struggling a bit. That sort of mid to upper end's a bit better. Um, and that market as well, if you can afford it, do you, would you pref would you recommend they build it and stage one of them or something? Would you or would you always try to like sell it off plans to start? Um, I think both are good options. Um, if you can, the low market at the moment, the client at the moment is holding on to them, so he'll hold on to them for another six months, then look at selling them. Um, with most financing structures, you have to sell a couple off the plans. Yeah. Um, but having a finished product is always the the ultimate. Um, you know, you walk through it. Um, I think that that's the ultimate in, in a good market. And what are um, what are the margins like at the or like profit margins like at the moment for developments like in the multi unit space? Um, <clears throat> they are very difficult to stack up at the moment. Um, so when we we do like as many free feasibilities as we need to do for that developer or client to be comfortable with the, the product that we're building, um, a lot of them don't stack up. So a lot of them, you know, you're making 10%, 10% or um, in a really good one, maybe 15. Um, in the booming days, you're looking over like 30. And that's, yeah, that's when it's a bit funner. You know, that's when it's like, because you want to be involved with, you want to be around money, basically. You want to be the client happy with the outcome and the return. You don't want to be scrimping on projects, trying to cut corner, cut costs. Um, yeah, so I think it's got to have a whole big revision of expectations on developments. A lot of sites don't stack up. Um, a lot of feasibilities don't stack up. So it's going to be interesting moving forward on yeah, what stands out and what works, which I think will be the middle to high end in that um, older market who have the money. Yeah. And what sort of mistakes are you seeing some developers making out there at the moment? Um, design would be the biggest one. So interior and exterior. Um, just not really thinking about it or not yeah, getting the full flow of the project or having stairs, walking up to the front door or... Just things that aren't really appealing to, to the general. You got to you got to be if you're selling an investment product, you got to appeal to ninety percent of the market, right? 
who, yeah. who want to buy it. Um, and the ones that are making those simple mistakes, they're very hard to sell. Very hard to sell. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, okay, so let's talk a little bit about your um, company. Yes. Because there's like a few elements to it. Um, you obviously, you have your, uh, your construction business. Yes. Right? Austin Projects. Um, and you sort of specialize in that multi-unit uh, market. But then also at the same time, because of your experience, um, you know, working for Williams Corp and other companies and, uh, and uh, how many units, uh, how many doors have you put up under your own um, company so far? Under our company, we, we, I think we're on to our fifth project. Um, so first financial year, it was um, around $2 million, uh, which was partly project management um, and it was also some, you know, Mostly project management. Um, and the second financial year, which is this one, um, is closer to 10 million. Um, and that's offering both project management. So that's normally catered to developers who have the money, who don't want to be involved, but want to move to the investor side. So I'll act as a project manager at a fixed fee to deliver that project for them. Right. Yep. And what would you – so you would essentially like act as the owner uh, in, sen in terms of what you do for them? Like yep. end, is it fully end-to-end? End-to-end. So um, two projects we have on the go at the moment is they had a site. Um, they had designed it for six. They took it all the way to RC approval. Then, uh, then it was declined. So then I come along get really involved with the design phase, um, see what will work, the most economical, the most profitable build that we can do on that site, then um, then, then, then we will deliver it. Um, but it, it's definitely being involved earlier on. Um, like that particular developer spent 300K and that's gone, right? Yeah. So not ideal. Um, if I can, yeah, my goal is to, just provide value is, is my fees are irrelevant. It's, it's just my goal is to have projects go smoother, um, to take the scare factor out of um, multi-unit stuff and yeah. just, yeah, have, have no, nothing hidden. Just have all your numbers in front of you, have a, have a very clear um, relationships with um, the finance team, um, the QS, the um, designers, and just really simplify the delivery process. So how are you guys um, kind of unique? You know, I guess you have like the real deep knowledge about the construction side, you know, you know about the project management side, yep. council, um, you, you know, your information and your feasibility is accurate because you understand the numbers. Uh, yeah, what sort of, you know, explain to me why, how you guys are sort of like uniquely positioned, I guess. Yeah. Um, so the yeah the two two offerings are one it's the fixed fee project management so our fees won't change for the delivery of a whole project um, and that's based on the you know feasibility at the start of a project that can save a developer um, say ten percent on average um, on costs so that can Im improve his return dramatically. Um, and it's the time frames on how long we take to deliver um, products. So Takapuna, we were on site in March building and we're finishing now. So it's at... So how long is that? Uh, <laughs> like five months? Five. When it's wrapped up, with well, CCC would be seven. So seven months what, from the ground up? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, that's pretty fast. Yes, and that's that helps... Um, developers and clients majorly because of the cost of um, finance. Yeah. Yeah. And like I said, with New Zealand and being semi-boom and bust, you've got to, you know, what cycle are you in? You can't miss the cycle. It's great if you're going into a climbing cycle, um, and that's sort of what we're heading into now, hopefully. Um, but you wouldn't want to be on the back end of a booming cycle. It's all about delivery and delivery at pace. Um, I call it the 60-40 rule. So you do 60% up front of planning and 40% of delivery on site. So it's 
Delivery on the site should be easy based on the amount of work you put in before the project starts. In terms of council and so on, are you, so you guys would take care of all of that, making sure that you can get like um, title issued and yes. all that in yes. time? Yeah? Yes, um, absolutely everything. So we'll do the design management before the project starts, then we'll do um, titles and CCC during the project. And we aim to have titles issued at painting stage. So that, yeah, that's, and that's a really good indication of you've done it in the right method. And it's very tricky. You've got multiple consultants, multiple inspections, multiple sign-offs, multiple parties, Vector, Chorus, Watercare, um, all require a different task to be done, a different um, way of doing things that you're all, you know, it's a lot of management. Yeah, it's kind of like that water care, like those are the ones that are you, mm. that you miss, right, if you're a, a green developer. Yeah. And yep. that's the stuff that's going to hold up and that's the stuff where you're yep. paying like four grand a day. 100%. Finance fees. Yep, to get um, tricky things are like works over, uh, a chorus sign-off certificate, uh, vector completion certificate, um, water care sign off, and then COA, EACC. Yeah. There's a lot. Um, and it's just got to be done in that process. Um, or if you do it, when you finish the project, you'll be adding about six months, five to six months to your project. Right. Okay. Yeah. So, okay. So, you, so, so from your point of view, it's very beneficial from what I can tell. It's very beneficial to have you guys involved To I mean, obviously you can just purely be the builder. And you'll do yep. a fixed price contract. Yep, we'll be. Um, so we have two options. It's either project management, uh, manage your project um, on whatever it is, high end homes, multi units, um, or we will be a main contractor builder um, and deliver that at a fixed um, fixed fee. Yeah. Okay. So um, before I talk about the builder side, from the project management side, what sort of fees do you guys charge? Um. It does vary. If the project obviously is a high value, we wouldn't be charging the same amount we would if the project was a million. Right. <clears throat> so very project related. Um, and the higher it is, the less the fee. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. And so, and then you also believe from your efficiencies and your experience, you're able to even <coughs> give them a better profitability. So then your fee, you know. It becomes... Our goal is for the fee to come become irrelevant. Um, we hope that we provide the best service possible that that customer um, feels they've saved it in other areas because I treat uh, everyone's money like it's my money and just, um, yeah, very, very careful with a lot of things. Like I just, on the way here, dropped um, some placemakers materials off to get a credit for the client. Right. There you go. <laughs> um, that's pretty good. That's a good service. Um, yeah. So you, uh, from a um, project management point of view, uh, so let's focus on that, so, so, or, or just the whole company essentially. Uh, talk to me through your company. So how many guys have you got working for you? Are they all employed or is it contractors? Yep. Or? <clears throat> so the main um, part of the company is myself and my wife. Um, so my wife does, is a qualified lawyer. She does our contracts and our interior design. Um, so that's been a massive, massive win and one that's hugely helpful with, um, you know, the, the back end as, and also the front end because we um, like to negotiate fixed price contracts based on what the client wants, not what we want. It's not about us. It's about the client getting the tiles, the kitchen, the flooring, the layout of the house that they want and what they want to spend. So then we sort of reverse engineer it so they have the budget they want to spend and they're happy with the, the product and, and what they're getting. Um, and then once we move into construction, um, it's all contract. So all our plumbers, electricians, we've used on over 50 projects, um, all through Williams, all through my own personal um, renovations and builds so those relationships are um you know are massive yeah and so uh and then builders as well so the, the chippies and stuff they're all yep. like contracted as well yes yeah. yes so what we do is think of we form a team based on that project yep. so we'll still use the same builders over and over again but some are not suited 
to certain developments and some are more suited to higher end projects that just need to take a little bit longer. So, and it also gives us the, um, it's the control too. Um, we, we want to act as a team. So I'm only as good as them, they're only as good as me and we, we're moving forward together into the next project. Yeah, okay. Yeah. And then obviously you guys have the consulting team as well, right? That yep. you've accumulated over time. Yep. And so the more you work together with those guys, the smoother and the trust is there. Because the trust is a big thing, right, at the start, especially if you're more green in development because you're trusting a consultant will do something. doesn't always necessarily mean it will get done. Yeah. The consultant side of development is one of the key elements um, and you don't want to be trialling a a new consultant um, just to see how it goes because it is uh, it's it's a big world out there you want to have really good relationships they want to be doing their part when it's required um, and, and just as smooth as possible but right. you've got to know what their role is better than they do otherwise you can't you know that's it's got to be that knowledge first then bringing them as part of your team. Yeah, they can't be like your advisors throughout. No, no. They're, yeah. they're, not, they're not your mentor. They're not your advisor. Um, they're part of your team. And, and that's why the experience and the years of learning, it can't be replaced. It's got to be five plus years of the sector you want to be in. Then you can progress. Right. So um, from the construction side, if you're someone that builds multi-unit, Mm. Uh, a lot, you know, there's a lot more um, elements that are important to the project, right? That are yep. different to a single family home. So, yes. for instance, speed of the project is <clears throat> probably yep. one example. And what other areas do you have to kind of like be, you know, almost niche to that? Yeah. So, when you're building a home, you're dealing with the specifications of the house. Then you're building with design, design changes and CCC, which is you know, your, your document at the end to say you're compliant. With development, add another five layers to it. You got your funding, your design, your um, consultants, your um, titles, your lawyers. It's, there's a lot more layers and, and it's just something that um, is just quite complex. Um, like I said, we have that document that has 150 items per sector that we need to go through and complete um, to get to the end. Yeah. And especially if you're speeding it up in brackets, you have you can't miss one of those items. If you miss one of those items, you're pulling up the driveways, you're, um, yeah, it's serious consequences. Yeah, so that, the reason I'm asking that question is because, you know, um, someone might want to do a development and they go, yeah, I'll just use my builder yeah. that built our house yeah. to do the multi-unit development. And what you're saying is like you'd probably be – would uh, advise them maybe against that. I wouldn't use a builder that hasn't done multi-unit um, because, one, they'll be learning on your project, and, two, um, they just hadn't done it before. So – but that's not to say – you know, we're the, the one-stop shop for multi-unit. It's just you've got to have done it. You've got to have spent that time learning the process. Yeah. And what advice would you have to people that, you know, because our builders listen to this and um, and they want to get into their developments, potentially yep. whatever. Uh, what advice would you give around picking the right consultants? Like how do you kind of like, what's a good process of bringing like a good level of consultants together? And who are all the <coughs> consultants you have to think about? Um, I, with anything, definitely trust your gut on how you feel um, with that architect. So the architect's the big one. You want to get on with them really well. They want to understand your vision, what you want to spend, <clears throat> what your required outcome is. Then they'll have multiple um, consultants underneath them. So that's like the planner, structural engineer, civil engineer, geotech. Uh, you've got flood, traffic, um, fire, so it, hydraulic, it can get more and more and more and more. Um, we do a commercial, commercial extension and that is about 10 consultants. So that's, that's yeah, it's quite a process. 
And when and as a um, construct a pure construction company that provides a fixed price contract to you know developers or whatever, is your would your margins generally be a bit lower than someone building a, a new home for a family? <laughs> yeah, yeah, we are, we're definitely um, flexible around um, our fees and our margin. Um, it's always about the project first, then we will head towards and see what is suited to that project. Um, yeah. But very different. Um, if you've got a big sort of um, standalone house that may take two years, um, we, can achieve, we can do the same thing in six months. So we're making that amount in six months, so it doesn't need to be as high. Right, yeah, that's 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 quite interesting uh, that you say that. Eh? That's important to know. Yeah, if you can make it quicker. <laughs> if you um, drag your margin out over two years, it's going to be less. It's about how much you can achieve in that period of time. Yeah. Awesome. This has been uh, this has been quite insightful. So this has been pretty good. We've cool. almost like it, the time's flying. Uh, we're almost at an hour already. Um, so we're going to be talking about this for like another eight hours, going back and forth. <laughs> um, but no, that's good. In terms of where you're at right now, I mean, you're, you're probably, what, you're like a couple of years into your bu current yep. business? Yep. Uh, and you've done a lot of your learning before you went into that, right? Um, what is sort of success to you at the moment? Um, success to me is, is enjoying what you're doing and spending the time with, you know, your loved ones as well and working with really good people. Um, that's massive, man. Like time's ticking so you've got to enjoy what you're doing every day you know have a laugh with the guys on site take them out for lunch buy them beers like it's you, this is life you know you've got to put a lot of effort into it and yeah yeah get the rewards just get one go at it eh? exactly there's no second chances as they say no that's good and and in terms of where you know you running your business or even yeah. working for you know, as a project manager on a lot of those other multi-units, you know, what sort of like the, I guess like the, what sort of the toughest times you've been through, you know, is there sort of anything you can sort of pinpoint in terms of um, a difficult time you've kind of worked through in this game? Um, I would say every stage of my career has had different learnings and none has been better or worse. Everything's been part, developed me to where I am today and I'm still learning Every day. And any any massive like development mistakes you've made in the last couple of years that you could like not in the last couple of years, no. Um, not for yeah. Um, the Williams was the biggest learning curve because you could again condensing say twenty years of work into three. <laughs> um, yeah, that's the biggest one. So builders are very much like um, practical beings yes. very much like input output um yep. you know and when you generally tell them that you could spend less time and make more money like that doesn't always compute mm. you know so how have you find the transition you know from um working as hard as you have to now working um probably smarter right would you say that you know you got time you mentioned before you got time to pick up your kids from school mm. or mm. from uh, school or preschool or kindy or whatever and uh, you have a lot more time and you ha you know you meaning you can bring more work on as well but you're getting good returns how how have you sort of navigated that in your in your head if that makes sense i don't know if that's a good way of asking it but like kind of um have you come to the realization now that you could that you know that if you work smarter you can almost like have a yep. better outcome and how do and how do you not feel guilty about that i guess is the real question yeah the, the first year of business is terrifying. Um, so you're, you're a male or a female. I'm a male. Um, you've got your family you have to take care of. Um, you want to make you know, your family proud. Um, you don't want to fail. So it's, it's huge. Um, but it just gets better. So it's got to be consistent and it's got to be working hard and it's got to have systems and in this second year, it's just got better. You know, your, your phone, I used to go to 10 meetings a week just to get one job. And I might not even get the one job. But I was happy that because I didn't get that job, there'll be one something coming up. So just, yeah, 
just look ahead, stay positive, and it just it does get better the longer you're you're in it. Yeah. You've got a family, right? So you've got a few kids, yes. as you mentioned before. How do you sort of navigate like family life and, and work and, and what sort of practical um, things have you started to implement to kind of... Oh, to be honest, you, you don't in your first two years. Um, I'll be asking my wife, you know, project questions and design questions over dinner um, in bed, whatever. <laughs> it's, you either go hard... Or go home basically you've got to just put it all in there and business it's um it's full on but it does get better it does get better yeah and do you think that uh, in the future you'll be doing a lot more you know focusing on building the construction business itself or do you think you'll be doing a lot of your own developments in the future um definitely my own developments um as well as construction um so my biggest thing is I enjoy the process. Um, that's how my brain works, is the process of delivery gets me up every day. If we stop there, I'm affecting a lot of other people. So that's the that's the big one for me, but I, I will definitely get into you know joint ventures with the right people, or we're currently looking for land ourselves, um, which is something cool to look at down the track, but all in good time, all in good time. Yeah. Um, are you the kind of guy that's like late at night, like looking at Trade Me, looking at different sites mm. and mm. doing little feasibilities in your head yeah. and figuring out if things could work? Are you just constantly doing that? Yes, and, and around the business, so constantly looking at zero, constantly right. checking your emails. So my phone, you know, sometimes you can have 100 calls a day, um, but yeah, I wouldn't change it. It's, it's, it's good. Yeah. What numbers are important to you and your business? You know, you say you're constantly looking at zero. Yep. Uh, yep. What, are the, what are the numbers that are, that are sort of important to you to make sure you're on track? Um, I would say it's profit margin um, and profit because that pays the bills. Um, Revenue is great, but it doesn't mean a lot. Um, so, yeah, my, it's monthly profit, really. Um, and if I can break down my projects... And doing better year on year, monthly. That's 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 excellent. Yeah, and part of that is a, is a big emphasis for you to keep an eye on your overheads and things like that. Oh, 100%. hundred um, percent. We don't have any overheads apart from home office, office, my car, and my phone. I highly recommend not to have overheads in your first couple of years. Yeah, yeah. It's not a good idea to go buy machinery the big ute just you sacrifice for your first couple of years and then it will improve and you can have those luxuries yeah later on yeah yeah because people love it i eh? just kind of getting the old ranger you know with yeah. all the extras you know on a yeah on high purchase or you know yeah. it's kind of like it's very easy to do right when you go yeah. out on your own it goes back to like matthew as well from williams he said if you can't afford it to pay it in cash twice, don't buy it, which has always sort of stuck with me. Yeah. Yeah. And you'll be surprised how much money you actually have. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's a good way of looking at it. Um, looking back at your career so far, you know, you had a very kind of a unique one. Um, does, if you want to just move a little bit closer to the mic there, sorry. You've had like a bit of an <coughs> interesting career in a sense that you did the business degree first and then you kind of went into, yep. uh, you know, getting your qualification and then the business. So you've done a lot of learning until, you know, even though your business is only two years old, yep. you've done a lot of the learning leading up to it, which I think is a smart way of doing it. Um, looking back now at that, you know, is there anything that you'd change or anything that you thought, you know, regret or thought you could, you know, you'd do different if you could go back in time? Not at all. Um, I'm really happy I didn't start any earlier um, because the risks are too high. Um, and it sh like I said before, it shouldn't be a risk to deliver someone's family home. It should be a process. So I'm happy I didn't rush it um, and it's just sort of set me up to now start and, and take off um, in a steady sort of way. Um, and if sort of money or status was not a uh, an object, like what? How would you have spend your time now? 
ongoing learning would be the biggest thing and just new experiences. Um, do you love le- just love learning and, and new things and new things, constant new things, um, and yeah, experiences. Yeah, do you have any hobbies or anything? Um, I attempt golf, which is um, can be interesting. But what else? Uh, a bit of shooting. My wife has a yeah. farm. Um, clay bird shooting. Um, but yeah, a lot of it is just family time. So weekends with the, with the kids and the family. Cool. Awesome. Um, I'm just asking some interesting questions. Always of uh, guests like these ones. So, like, if you were uh, less afraid of other people's opinions, what would you uh, talk about more? Um, I'd probably say your feelings and how you're feeling that day based on um, what's happened that day. Do you talk more about your feelings? No. Oh, are you saying <laughs> you, say you should talk less about your feelings? Are you say probably talk more. Um, communicate more right. with those people who are close to you. Yeah. It would be would be a big one. Um, yeah. Open up. Yeah, I think that's good. Um, and what's the thing that's making you happiest right now in life? Um, it's, it's providing a good life for my family is, is the biggest thing. Um, and, yeah, provide, having options... Spending more time with them, that's massive. Like I used to leave home at seven, spend an hour and a half in traffic there and an hour and a half back in traffic. So three hours a day in the car, I'd get in at six o'clock and they'd go to sleep. That's not fun. Yeah, yeah. that's not kind of a way to live, eh? Cause it, no. Yeah, because I used to do two hours a, 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 day, a day. So And then I worked out that was like that's – uh, 40 hours a, a month so a whole work week uh in traffic per month mm. Mm. is not you know once you start working that back it's sort of you yeah. know success for me is um being in control of your own time is is massive yeah a hundred percent a hundred percent um and who's been the most influ- influential person in your life so far um i will have to say my wife uh, we met at school um, since high we were, school sweethearts. Yes. Oh, yes. yuck. <laughs> <laughs> so that's cute. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah, um, and she's just you know the one who's been through everything with you, all the jobs, all the different you know the degrees and the learning, and here we are, sort of into that family stage. So. Oh, that's cool. And how is being coming a dad? Because your oldest one's like six, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. How has becoming a dad changed how you sort of operate your business? You know, do you feel like you would have done it differently if you were not didn't have any kids? Um. No, no, no real change. Um, yeah, it's all sort of panned out quite how how it should have, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and finally, what? sort of role has failure played in your success so far and do do you see failure as something that's good or bad or what's your sort of relationship with failure oh failure to me is the same as 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 risk i described it to um someone the other day i said it's like crossing the road right risk and failure um if you cross the road when the lights are on you know, it's a very risky situation. But if they're off, it takes it away. Like, it shouldn't It shouldn't be overcomplicated. It, it should just be a, a thought-out process, and um, you're always going to fail. But you've got to get there. You've got to get there and go through those failures. Um, I've failed multiple times, but you've just got to learn to recover faster and um, move on and learn from it. Yeah, don't fail twice. Don't cross the road twice. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's, I think that's a really good way um, yeah, to finish that component. I want to do some rapid fire questions yes. before, uh, before I let you go. It's been great to, um, yeah, it's been great to have you on and kind of just learn the, you know, the multi-unit and the development angle as well. Like a lot of builders listening to this, you know, they may only be focusing on single home. They want to my, maybe work with more developers in the future. Um, or they may want to get into development themselves, yeah. uh, and um, and I think it's yeah, I think it's a super valuable to kind of 
provide them with that information. And so, yeah, thanks for being open with the, all the information, you know. No problem. Um, so, yeah, rapid fire. Let's get into it. Oliver, okay, how big is your team? Um, in the office, it's only two. Okay. Uh, and obviously you have that um, people on the, all the contractors and the consultants. Yeah. Um, how many uh, projects did you complete last year? Or how many, how many units did you build last year, should I say? Last year, um, we'll say two projects, um, which was about five units. Um, this year, it will be 10 plus. Okay, awesome. Um, what was your turnover last year? One to three, three to five, five to seven, seven to 10, 10 to 15, 15 plus. Last year was two. This year will be closer to 10 plus. Wow, that's a big, big jump. Yeah. Uh, what's the lowest gross profit margin um, building companies should be aiming for when they're building um, multi-unit? I'll say 15%. Okay. Um, free quote or paid quote? Um, paid if it's the first time. And unpaid if it's a um, existing client, right? And you do like free feasibilities, right, for yes. clients? Yes. So they and what does that involve? They come, they give you a site, and they yep. go, "This yep. is this so is what we'll, we want to do." We'll either, if it's a basically an investor developer, he'll want us to find him a site, um, do a scheme plan, do a feasibility to show the return on the site, and we'll do that multiple times. Um, you know, up to 10 to 15 times until he finds one he's comfortable with. Um, but yeah, any sites or any projects we'll do a feasibility on, um, show the numbers, um, show the return. Um, and how do you know he's not wasting your time? Like, is it just part of your sales number? You just, it's just the percentage thing, like some... Um, it goes back to that, that Vivian interview you had um, around the 400 million discussion and he gets 40 million of work and I don't I totally agree with that like it's just time in the seat and then how much work comes through you can't control people's emotions and what they're going through in their life so you've just got to be involved in discussing more and more projects yeah um, yeah there's profit in all labor I someone said to me once and so and and you know and then, and then another quote around that I've mentioned here a couple of times is that whole um, if you do more than you're getting paid for, eventually you get paid for more than what you yeah. do. And it's kind of fits into that, right? Eventually those developers will come back around if they don't go this time around. Or, 100%. Okay. Um, project management software or spreadsheets? Uh, both. Um, fixed price contract or charge up for your multi-units? Uh, fixed price. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, we've just know the numbers so well and we want to be involved with the no surprise projects. Yeah. Um, where the client knows every single dollar that they're going to spend. Yeah. And from the financing point of view and all that, you probably need all fixed price to for everyone yeah. to get your funding. and Definitely. Uh, EV or petrol head? Petrol. Would you rather have a beer with a consultant, a subby or a council member? Probably a consultant, just because of their knowledge base. I'm around subcontractors every day, um, which is great. But, yeah, there's some interesting stuff happening in different industries. Yeah. Jock or hippie? I played rugby, so jock. Do you play rugby for St. Kent's? Yeah, St. Kent's. What thing. position? Prop. Prop. Oh, I love it. Yeah, I played. I would have played. Okay, I went to grammar, so I would have played against St. Kent's. Is that, um, is that you guys have the field to the views? Yeah, and the yeah. grandstand and yeah, 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 yeah. It's yeah. really nice. Out That's there. awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Had a few guys on here, eh, from St. Kings. Oh, very good. I think uh, wine or whiskey, red wine. Uh, these days, apprentices are a soft, b open minded, d hard workers. So you, you cross paths with apprentices much or not really? Not really, um, but based on some, you know, of the other age group, um, hard work is not going to replace any any education you know you've got to just work hard so it's not going to be easy and you just got to get in and, and do it don't overcomplicate it yeah uh, are you too mean or too nice to your staff or or, or contractors 
Um, we'll say mean because I'm hard but firm but also respectful. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's good. My firm's good. Um, most used emoji? Um, probably the sideways laughing face. Yeah. Yeah, I, that's a good one. I, I also try to – you can't take it too seriously too. Yeah. Things happen. Because sometimes the normal smiley face is not enough, eh? It's almost like wallpaper now. So if mm. you put the normal one, they go, oh, you're not really finding yeah. that funny. But if you do the sideways one, then you really find that funny, Definitely. right? It's Definitely. Kind of, um, kind of what I think. Uh, are you an extrovert or introvert? Um, I'd probably say more introvert. Cool. What song gets you pumped up for the day if you have one? Um, me and my daughter's favourite at the moment is Eye of the Tiger. Oh, yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> that's a good one. It gets you pumped up. Uh, what's your favourite business or non-business book? Um, the Nike story is pretty epic. That's good. Shoe Dog? Shoe Dog. Yeah, that's yeah. a good one, eh? It's a that, great book. That's just hard work. Yeah. He just turned up every day and... Just Keeps fa keeps failing, like even though he's got like hundreds of millions of sales, it's still like and go down any moment, right? Yeah, amazing. Yeah, yeah, that is a great book. Actually, I haven't read that one in a while. Uh, what's one item you can't live without? Um, I'll say my car. <laughs> yeah, Get my around. my cell phone probably. Yeah, uh, the tool of the trade it would be the phone. Exactly. Yeah, car we all love phone. our phones. Yeah, too much sometimes. Definitely. Um. Mm. Cool. Oliver, did you have fun? Yes. No, thanks for having me. It was really good to meet you and discuss, um, yeah, multi-unit stuff. Yeah, no, it's good to have you on and I'm sure we'll, um, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll continue and probably um, uh, get you on again in, a, in another capacity to talk more development stuff or whatever. So, no, it's been good, good fun for me. So thanks, thanks a lot, mate. Appreciate it. <laughs>